evening, ladies and gents. Uh, Simon Brown here doing the intro for Keith McClachlan this evening. As I said, Keith doing this is the last one from Keith for the year. And what he's doing is, is going back, we've been doing the, the DCF, uh, Discount Cash Flow. There are three in the series already. And as we do when we conclude the series, we then go and do a case study. In this particular example, we're going to be doing ISA Holdings, a small cap listed on the JSC. Uh, importantly, and Keith will reiterate this, but to reiterate it up front again, is not investment advice. This really is just uh, given as a case study. With that, over to Keith. Thanks, Simon. Um, just, just to recap, this is the webinar series about the fundamentals of equities. Um, and I like to classify them into the four pillars, which is profitability, the aim of the business, liquidity, cash is king, solvency, really debt versus risk and management. Um, when you're investing in a, in a business, you're actually investing in people. Now, all of these are just understanding the business, building your concept of fundamentals so, so that you can do a much better, more accurate valuation. Because believe it or not, valuation is not a science. It's not quite an art. It's, it's more a skill. Um, and once you have the valuation, it leads to an investment decision. Um, I would, because this has been, this, this webinar series has been running for over a year now, well, well over a year. So there's quite a lot of back history. Uh, if, if you can't remember aspects or you just want to refresh, uh, I strongly encourage that you go have a look at the older videos and just one map of, on this series, particularly the four pillars. And as we touch on, the, on rehashing the DCF model, perhaps go have a look at the three parts of the DCF model that I have separate uh, webinars on as well. Um, so once you understand the fundamentals and you're starting to dig into the valuations, there's really two major classifications of valuation methodology. The first one is the relative valuation. You're using market ratios. You're saying if this is worth that, how much is this company worth? So it's, it, you, basically, you're looking at everything's moving, all the constants are moving, all, all the variables are moving. So, you, so you're pegging a relative to the rest of the market. Then you have the absolute valuation models, where you're actually valuing the business almost in isolation. And, and that's where discounted free cash flow comes in. Then, just a bit of a recap, we're going to use very briefly... Um, and you'll see it coming in a much later slide, the cost of equity and the weighted average cost of capital, the WAC. Um, I'm not going to explain what these are. There is an entire webinar on them, so I encourage you to go have a look on that. It's, it's quite an abstract, um, esoteric concept. It's very important, particularly if you're doing the absolute valuations where you're actually discounting cash flows back to the future. You have to discount, or, or present value is another word, you have to present value them at a certain interest rate. Uh, well, at a certain rate, and in this case, the, the rate is the cost of equity, and if there's debt, the weighted average cost of capital. The cost of equity is the required weight to return shareholders demand for accepting the risk of providing share capital. The riskier the business, the more return you expect, and hence the higher the discount rate and the lower your present value. If you have debt, the weighted average cost of capital is the combination of cost of equity and the cost of debt together at a weighted so in other words, the WAC is the total cost of the firm's capital, taking into account a different amount of debt and equity. Have a glance, uh, I've probably confused everybody there, but have a glance at the previous uh, webinar on, on the cost of equity and WAC for much more detail. I'm not going to spend more time on this now. Then, uh, just a refresh on what free cash flow is. The definition of free cash flow is operating cash flow minus capital expenditure. The formula free for free cash flow is EBIT. EBIT is earnings before interest and tax, and you have to um, put it post-tax. So this is why I say one less the tax rate. So you're having post-tax EBIT. EBIT is another name for operating profit. Then you're adding depreciation and amortization because they're non-cash flow items, and you're dropping working capital because working capital, net working capital is a financing. So it's not the absolute working capital, it's a change in working capital that, you, that you're taking out of the free cash flow. Um, because it's a financing cost in the business and it absorbs cash flows and less the capex because you're adding back the depreciation, um, it's a non-cash flow item and amortization too, you're spending money on building the business and that's actual cash flows, buying property, buying plant, buying land, the lot to expand the business, that's, you have to minus the capex because you're drawing down your cash flows. That's free cash flow. Now free cash flow in isolation is just a concept. 
the DCF, the discounted free cash flow model, includes, we aren't, we aren't really care what happened in the past. We're looking at what's going to happen in the future. So once you understand what the free cash flow is, the concept, you've got to forecast it. And this is very simple. Here we are in the present day, and we're forecasting the free cash flow according to the formula to arrive at the free cash flow now and all the way into the future until we reach something called the terminal year. And you consider all these things at the bottom, have a read through. I do have an entire webinar on the concept of forecasting free cash flow. But you're looking into the future, and hopefully if it's a good company, the free cash flow is growing. Then the important part is because it's not the free cash flow model, it's the discounted free cash flow model. Once we've forecasted all these future cash flows, we bring them all back to the present. We present value them because, of course, one rand now is worth more than one rand in 10 years' time. So you're working out because as the business is growing, the time value of money is, is impacting its value as well. So you've got to present value all that growth and all those free cash flows back to get to one single value right now. And you will see that uh, I have this concept called the terminal year. The terminal year is really important. And it's a horrible academic assumption, but unfortunately, when dealing with the future, things start to get a little academic. And the terminal value really says that, okay, the company, normal company life cycle is you start off growing aggressively, the growth slows down, and eventually you go X growth, and you tick along at basically you know, the economy's growth rate. Because if you didn't tick along the economy's growth rate, and you tick along at more than that, eventually you'd own the economy. You would be the economy. So the odds are the terminal growth rate is starting to approach, if not give or take a couple of basis points away from the GDP and the long-term GDP. And the point is, it's, we approach it in the, in, the, in the DCF model as basically a perpetuity, a perpetuity value formula, which is the free cash flow divided by whatever your discount rate is, WAC or cost of equity, less the terminal growth rate, and I'll touch on the terminal growth rate, times the discount factor you arrive at your present value of the terminal value. Now, terminal value is pretty important, but that is in a previous webinar, and this is just the, the, uh, the build-up to actually the case study, just for refreshing you guys until we jump into it. So I'm not going to talk too much more about the terminal value until we're in the case study. The case study today is ISA Holdings Limited. ISA stands for Information Security Architects. First disclaimer is this is a case study, not investment advice. The second disclaimer is I actually own shares in this. So I may well be biased. Um, just noting it out there, putting it out there. Um, the point is, I say holdings. I'm not going to go into the fundamental analysis, the four, four pillars of it. I'm going to try to briefly summarize it here um, and then jump, because the focus of the case study is not on the fundamental analysis, it's actually on the DCF. That's what we want to dig into. But you need a bit of background to understand the company. ISA Holdings is an information communication technology security services group. Big word. Basically, they build, maintain secure networks, including firewalls, routers. They do RT security. And it's a service firm that uses products. And so these are some of the products down here. Uh, you may recognize Checkpoint, Microsoft is a big one, F-Secure, Bluecoat, WebSense, and the like. Um, they take all these products developed by other people, and they, they add the value of service. They install them. They consult into them. They maintain them and the like. So it's really a RT service company that focuses on the security environment in South Africa. And oh, by the way, they're only really in South Africa. The services are predominantly, they sell them to the banks, because obviously banks, um, security spend in banks, RT security spend is fairly, fairly non-discretionary. You need to have a really secure environment. They also sell to top tier corporates. Um, because of the way they structure the services, they have a large underpin of annuity or reoccurring income. It's really... We install this the solution for you, and we will monitor and maintain it, and we will charge you for that. So they build up an annuity income. Why it's very nice is because it's annuity income is backed up by cash, and it's fairly stable. So you, when, if you look at their revenue base, their revenue base and and their results tend to be relatively stable. It's not like a junior miner or, or anything like like that. This is, this is a company that is reasonably, comfortably forecastable. 
obviously we're within the margins of error. Um, in a nutshell, ISA is a highly specialized niche service firm. Here's, here's a summary of its uh, financials. I'm not really going to go into it. I'm just including it all for interest. You can always go back. In fact, Google the company. Go, go have a look. Um, where do we start off our DCF with ISA? Obviously, the first part is we can't look at the we can't look at the historics. These are nice and these are pretty and these are wonderful, but the historics are meaningless. And note the latest historic is the interim results. The DCF is about the future cash flows. So you'll notice my first cash flow is uh, my first period isn't even a full year, it's just the next six months the next interim period. Um, and then what I'm starting off with is EBITDA. Remember how when you go back to the formula, where free cash flows, EBIT, a post-tax, plus depreciation, amortization, EBITDA is earnings before tax, interest, uh, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. EBITDA is EBIT. Um, adding, adding back depreciation and amortization. So that's exactly what I've done. So I've started already at, at and now some companies disclose this, some don't. Some you might have to take either to operating cash flow, operating profit and add depreciation and add amortization to arrive at EBITDA. But luckily, uh, ISA relatively well discloses it, so I have it. So I'm starting straight there. Um, next, so what I'm doing is uh, I have my forecasts for, for these periods. Now these will, may well be wrong. And this is the reality of trying to forecast the future. Um, you know, the crystal ball sometimes gets kind of murky. Uh, so this is my forecast period. Looking at the next, uh, the rest of the year, it's going to be a tough year, I know. Uh, and next year, hopefully, a bit of a recovery. But then I have this period where you just see seven strung across. Now, my, my theory there is, is fairly simple. The tech sector in South Africa is growing faster than GDP. It's growing about 5 6% per annum. Um, it won't be growing at that forever, but within the tech sector, the, the security, the RCT security sector within the tech sector is the fastest growing part of the tech sector. So um, I'm looking at this, and I say it's not, not acquisitive. Uh, they all do organic growth, a fairly steady growth, with a heavy underpin of a new and re reoccurring income. So you've got a fairly stable base going forward. So I'm saying if the tech sector grows at 5 or 6% per annum for the next couple of years, I say the odds are it will grow a little faster. So I'm, I'm pegging it in this model. The assumption is I'm pegging it at 7. But then you hit the terminal year. Now the terminal year, in the long term, uh, technology remains growth. Uh, it's not just growth because of the technology refresh cycle. As technology gets old, you have to buy new. But also because of the innovation cycle. Think about it. Five years ago, you had no idea that you needed a uh, tablet computing. You needed an iPad or a Galaxy Tab or, or, or any Android or anything like that. Now, you're suddenly thinking you maybe need that. Innovation carves out new markets. So you find innovation added with the te a technology um, refresh cycle combines to make the tech sector grow slightly faster than GDP. Um, now, if our GDP, let's make my assumption, the South African GDP will grow at about 3.5% in the long term. I've added 1.5% to ISA because it's not just in the tech sector. That perhaps, in the, perhaps in the long term, we'll grow at about 4 to 4.5% in South Africa. I added another point or two to it, so I'm rounded up to about five percent, um, and that's very simple. Within my forecast period and outside of it, I'm just taking the previous year's EBITDA and multiplying by that growth factor. That's how we get EBITDA in the forecast in the, in the DCF. Then the tax rate. Now this takes a lot of back analysis. Uh, work out the effective tax rate at operating profit level. The effective tax rate isn't actually always the one in the income statement, um, and this takes a bit of financial engineering and back testing and the like. But what I find, if I take the effective tax paid per year and I compare it to ISA's EBITDA per year, it tends to be about 28.5% of EBITDA. So I'm simply stripping out 25.8% of EBITDA every year. 9.7 uh, 9 million there, 
multiplied by 28.5% tax rate arrives at 2.7 million. And I just copy paste that formula across the entire tab. DCFs work really well in Excel, by the way. Um, this this will be a little complicated on the paper. I strongly recommend Excel. Probably the single best thing uh, Microsoft has ever made. Um, and that's that's the tax rate, even into the terminal year. Now, obviously, the assumption EBITDA there is because ISA does have some RAND influence in its numbers, I'm assuming a stable RAND exchange rate all across the numbers. There's also an implicit assumption that the, te the corporate tax rate doesn't change. So there are a lot of assumptions of DCS. The next level is CAPEX. How much CAPEX does ISA need to spend? Um, the interesting thing is, and it depends on the business, and you've got to really understand the business, and this is why I talk about the four pillars of fundamentals, understand the business, you understand its CapEx profile. Um, I say as a service business, CapEx really isn't a big component of, of delivering a service because your biggest single cost is your payroll. And your payroll is already in your income statement and your income statement is already captured in the EBITDA. But you do have to buy, you know, buy a couple more buildings, buy a couple more this, buy a couple more computers for the employees, buy this, buy that. So CapEx, you know, every business has at least a bit of CapEx. Um, and if I, if I do a bit of back testing, I actually find that I can peg CapEx to about 2% of EBITDA. So I simply drag across that formula, 2% of EBITDA. Even in the terminal, it becomes 2%. And now normally, your CapEx profile might rise and then fall as the company goes X growth because they're expanding when they're growing. When they've stopped growing, they stop expanding CapEx and just to mention this CapEx. So often in your terminal year, your, your CapEx profile drops dramatically. This I do include in the webinar about forecasting free cash flows. Um, and ISA is a little unique here where I don't really drop that uh, terminal year uh, CapEx that much. It's, you do see it comes down a bit, but I drop down to about uh, one, one and a half percent. Uh, then you have working capital. Now, forecasting working capital is pretty tricky. Often the way I go about it is I work with debtors days, creditors days, and inventory days. Now you'll notice in, in ISA, as a service company delivering a service, they don't really have inventories. So I'm assuming that they're never going to have inventories. My inventory days are nil. Then it's really working out my net working capital is actually just a question about how quick are the debtors going to pay me versus how quick are the creditors going to pay me. And um, I've assumed that a stable ratio of 50 debtors days to 60 creditors days um, is, and, and, and simply drag it right across. Um, once again, look at, look at forecasting the uh, DCF, uh, forecasting the free cash flows to understand that. And often what you find is creditors days, as you get bigger, you can push up paying your creditors more and more. Um, but it depends how much uh, purchasing power you have because sometimes your creditors get pushed out more and more as well. Uh, forecasting working capital is pretty tricky. Hopefully, it shouldn't swing your model too much. If you, forecasting your working capital swings your model a lot, it's often a sign that uh, 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 the company actually doesn't have very strong sustainable return on equity. So it's actually not a great company. In ISA's case, luckily, it's a very small component. Uh, and then what, we've got all the we've got all the facts. We've got the the uh, profitable cash flows after tax. We're chopping out capex and we're adjusting for working capital. So we if we just add all of those up, we have the free cash flow, and I'm forecasting it for the next ten years into the terminal year. Now this terminal year is that number two two hundred thirty one million is not these added up. If you go back to the terminal year forecast, which is somewhere here, I'm pretty certain. Oh, there we go. The terminal year forecast, don't forget you're taking the free cash flows and dividing it by your discount factor less your terminal growth rate. It's a bit of a complicated formula, but it's actually a perpetuity. Yes, I'm assuming that this free cash flows is made in, uh, uh, perpetually. Hence, it's called a perpetuity. So go back and review that webinar as well, um, where, where I look about the discounting free cash flows. So now we have our free cash flows. We worked out our terminal years uh, per um, uh, this, uh, the free cash flow in, in perpetuity. What do we do? We discount it because those cash flows in isolation are meaningless. We want one single 
figure to compare to the share price to say whether I should buy the share or I should sell the share or make make my investment decision. So now this discount rate, uh, I've actually calculated based on one rand at the cost of equity. Now something I didn't mention about ISA is that they have no debt. So their cost of equity is their weighted average cost of capital. Because you have no debt, the, the weighting of debt in the WAC is zero. So the cost of equity is their WAC. So the discount rate here is quite simply put at the cost of equity, which is roughly 15%. And I've said if one rand, if I got paid one rand six months in the future, how much would it be worth now at 15% per annum? It would be worth 93 cents. And so in one and a half years, 81 cents, 70 cents, 61. You can see it dropping, dropping, dropping all the way. In 10 years' time, it's worth 26 cents, and that's the terminal growth here. So the way you take these free cash flows and you discount them is you work out this factor, and it's the present value, the PV formula in uh, Excel spreadsheet. You can get this from there. Um, just, uh, doing a lecture about the time value of money is a bit outside of the scope of this uh, webinar, but if it confuses you, I strongly suggest you, you go read a book by Wikipedia, Investopedia, and the like have some very good um, uh, data on it, or uh, uh, essays and the like on it. So the free cash flow is quite simply 5.3 bar times 0.93, arrive at 4.9 bar. And every year, I'm just timesing these down. So you're arriving at your discount free cash flows for the year, and you quite simply just add them all up. This 141 million are all of these free cash flows added up. Now, don't forget that what we valued, because bear in mind that this is earnings before interest, interest, tax depreciation and amortization. So you're doing this entire free cash flow before interest or cash. You're actually valuing the enterprise and not the equity. We want a value for the share and not the enterprise. Um, so this 141 million, which is the sum of all of these free cash flows discounted to the present day, I either add back the cash, or I de well, I add back the net cash, or I subtract the net debt. Net cash is where there's more cash than debt, and I've taken the debt out of the cash. And net debt is where there's more debt than cash, and I've taken out the cash from the debt. And the point is, the enterprise value is the total cost of a business from all its funders' perspectives. When you take out the debt and you add back the cash, you arrive at the actual fair value of the equity and only the equity. In this case, remember how I said ISA has no debt? Well, because it has no debt, it means it's actually in cash. So instead of taking out debt, this 141 million, I'm adding 21 million cash. So our fair value of equity actually rises to 163 million. Now, if you take the 163 million and divide by the number of shares in issue, you arrive at 89 cents per share. And that is your DCF fair value. A nice little check I like to do, because you, you've noticed, working all the way through this, there's tons of assumptions in this model. A nice little check I like to do is, once you arrive at that fair value, take its earnings and divide that fair value by that and see what it's implied fair value is, or implied price earnings at least is. So 89 cents divided by ISA's uh, current 12-month uh, rolling earnings is a price earnings of about 13.4. And if you take its, uh, its dividend, it's a dividend yield of about 6.7. Now, 13.4 uh, price earnings is actually below the JC all share of 14 times, or 14 and some change. Um, it's, a, it's a little above the tech sector, you know, it's perhaps a little demanding, perhaps the fair value is a little lower, perhaps I could tweak this terminal value down to 4%, drop these to 6%, you arrive at a price earnings of about 10, 11, feeling more comfortable. The point is, this is a very nice logic check. You're logic checking what this implied fair value is that you've arrived at. Remember how when I go back and ever ask me, which model do you use? In this sense, you're actually using a price earnings model as well, and a dividend yield model but you're double-checking the workings. So, what is the conclusion? And as a case study, I have to have a conclusion, because we worked out its fair value, and its fair value is 89 cents. When I built this webinar a couple of days ago, ISA's share price was 52 cents. Its implied discount to fair value is about 71%. That is a hell of a discount, so it sounds like ISA is a massive volume at these levels. 
Um, I need to note, I obviously own the share here. My assumptions there could be wrong. My forecast could be wrong, and I, it could well be biased. So I'm not telling you to go out there and buy the share. I'm using this as a case study. Um, but this is how you do a DCF practically. You arrive at a fair value, compare it to the share price, and you get an answer that's often fairly, fairly blunt. Buy, sell, hold. So guys, uh, I hope we still actually have people here and I haven't put you all to sleep. Uh, we're open for questions. Yeah, I've got to say, Keith, you've been bending my brain with this DCF the whole time. That one made sense. <laughs> it, yeah, absolutely it did. A couple of questions coming through already, folks. If you've got them, stick them in the Q&A box. The one question is, and I noted it too, on your earlier screen, the price to book when you were showing us the, the uh, historic data for ISA, their earnings, the price to book had been moving higher and was sitting now at 2.6. And, and the question is quite simple. From the earlier price to book webinar that you did, doesn't that therefore suggest that uh, perhaps it's not such a bargain? Well, remember I say that you, uh, having all these valuation models is useful and is, it's nice to apply all of them, but some of them are more appropriate than others and sometimes some of them are just simply not appropriate. What is ISA? The business model of ISA is a service business, servicing, using its niche positioning and special skills in RT security to sell in, into business. Now, what is a service business? What is the service business's biggest asset? It isn't its balance sheet. It's its people. And its people aren't on its balance sheet. Its people are actually the, the payroll. Um, so what you have is you have a balance sheet that cannot ever actually take into account the human capital that this business controls uh, or has access to. And hence, you have a net asset value that is not reflective of the business model. So, in ISA's case, I would say the price-to-book ratio is almost entirely irrelevant because the price-to-book ratio is built off an uh, IFRS balance sheet, and the IFRS balance sheet does not take into account its business model, which is people, services. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's a great answer, and it flies straight into the next question, which was uh, from DCF, and this is coming from Hein. DCF is, is oh, well, he just says it, useless on a mining stock. Actually, a DCF is probably the only model you would use in a mining stock. Because bear in mind, the biggest assumption in a DCF in a company is the terminal growth rate, the terminal year. It, it takes up the... If you go back, you see when I present value it, all of these are nice, nice uh, discounted uh, free cash flows, but that is 60 bar, 60 bar over 141 bar. It's almost, you know, it's about 40% of the sum of value. Now, a terminal, value, a terminal year is a massive assumption. In a mining company, there is no terminal year often because you have a finite asset. And when a mine is dug there, and you've extracted all the minerals, there is nothing left. So you actually do a DCF that is a finite DCF until the end of the life of mine. So you couldn't work a, 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 a um, mining company necessarily on a price earnings or price to book. Because there's different ramp ups and different production and different yeah and things coming at different times, so a DCF is probably actually the single most appropriate methodology for valuing a mining company. I, I want to jump in there with with Virginia to say yes, concurred. If you've got one shaft, if you are Billiton and you've got 20 productions and 20 projects and everything else. If you've got one gold shaft and it's got a 15-year life of mine, your DCF is brilliant. Nice, easy, bang. But it's when you've got 15 different shafts and three explorations and one ramp up, one greenfield, one brownfield, then it becomes... Well, this is actually an interesting question. This goes a little bit to uh, investor relations. Now, if you're valuing a, one of the smaller miner, junior miners, even if they have a couple of mines, you can actually do an individual DCF for each mine add them all in and get a sum of parts and that's your value for, for the mine. Now, a Bolton or angler, even a top, top, top analyst can try to do DCFs for every single mine, every single exploration project, every single thing. You just humanly probably can't. So what a lot of the top analysts do for the major multinational mining houses is they actually have a terminal year where they just give a, a thumb suck for, for the blue sky inherent in the, in, in the exploration portfolio of, of the massive mining house. But that is actually why the mining house has that exploration portfolio. 
99% of the exploration portfolio will be meaningless, they'll sell it off and then nothing will happen. But they have it so that they can prove that they have a sustainable business model. If they prove they can have a sustainable business model, you can give them a terminal year. If you give them a terminal year, that's often the weight of the sum of parts. Does it make a little bit of sense? It makes a large amount of sense, and I like the idea of putting it apart. Uh, in other words, go to someone simple like Pan Af and go and look at each of their different assets, value individually, add them together. I remember someone doing that on SAB back in the 90s when they owned a dozen. They had PG Glass and Ed Con, and he went and valued each business individually and came to some parts that was significantly more than the then 30 or 40 rand it was trading at. Uh, a last question because we're bumping up against time and it, it, it's a bit of a question and a comment uh, coming from Helena. Graham, I'll take yours in a moment. Uh, Helena's saying she really liked your implied PE and dividend yield and so did I. She says, shouldn't you do that with all valuations? Just kind of a reality check as you were saying. A absolutely. This is why I say you never use one valuation methodology in isolation. Well, often you don't. Um, and, and all the DCS and all, you know, you, you're using all of these things together because you're saying, yeah, it doesn't work. Um, does, does this model agree with that model? Because maybe you, maybe you decide ISA is the appropriate business to do a price to book. And you realize, you know, two times price to book doesn't agree with my DCF fair value, where actually it's my DCF and price are four times book. So, whoa, I have massive disparity. Wow. And then you investigate and you come with a conclusion. So, absolutely, reality checks are extremely important in a rather esoteric science and skill of valuation. Graham, uh, your question, and I'm not sure if I'm quite getting it, and if not, please expand upon it. The question is, how does one look at the risk in this model? Oh. Now, there's two ways to do a DCF. I, I, we have obviously limited time, and I don't want to get too complicated. But obviously, when you're forecasting, inflation exists and risk. So what I've done is my cost of equity, my discount rate, is a nominal rate. It takes into account um, inflation. So I'm not forecasting inflation each year and factoring into my numbers and then discounting at a real rate. I'm discounting back at a nominal rate and forecasting in real terms, if I didn't confuse you too much there. Then the second thing is it's very simple. The way a DCF takes into account risk is the cost of equity and the WAC, particularly the cost of equity. The higher risk the business is, the higher the cost of equity you will be. The higher the discount rate, the lower the discount factors, and the lower, when you times this amount by that amount, the actual present value of the free cash flow will be. Don't double count risk. Don't discount your, your equity value after you DCF it, take into account your risk factor in your cost of equity. The riskier the business is, the higher the cost of equity is. Gotcha. Made perfect sense. Ladies and gents, we're going to leave it there uh, because we're bump, bumping up against the time. Uh, Keith, as always, really appreciate it. It's the last one from Keith for this year, but we will have a couple more. I think you said the dividend discount model in the new year. Uh, and then pretty much we wrapped up valuations, but certainly we'll be back. Uh, Keith, thanks to you. And ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time. Simon, thanks very much. And uh, guys, have a good uh, festive period.